Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our Watch New and IP 2019 webinar. We are very close to releasing IP 2019, should be uh, with you in the coming days so look out for an announcement about that. Um, there's lots of exciting new features in the new release that we would uh, we would like to show you. So today we're going to give you a, a, a preview of what to expect. I'm Ross Brackenridge. I'm, I'm the IP Technical Manager for IP. Uh, I'll be hosting today's session and I will also be joined by Paul Spooner, who's our IP Product Champion. So the agenda for today is we'll start off with all the uh, completely new additions to IP 2019, so uh, new modules and functionality. We'll then move on to uh, going through some of the upgrades that have been made to uh, existing modules, and uh, then we'll have a little bit about what's coming soon before we close. Uh, as I say, about 45 minutes in total. Um, Unfortunately, we won't be able to take uh, answer live uh, questions at the end of the webinar, um, but feel free to ask questions through either through the GoToWebinar portal or by contacting us on our uh, digital products email address. And any questions you send to that, we will uh, respond to you directly uh, very shortly. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the completely new additions to IP 2019. Um, two of the main new additions are the new Curve Auto Edit module and also the ability to tilt parameters. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Paul Spooner. He's going to uh, tell us a bit about both those new features. The Curve Auto Edit module allows you to repair uh, logs affected by washouts. Um, now the default setup is to repair a density neutron, uh, compressional sonic and a PE. And it does this by using multilinear regressions. It creates a multilinear regression for each curve, predicting each curve, using all the others as inputs. And <clears throat> to make this robust, we also require two other good curves. Um, and so we ask for a gamma ray and a deep resistivity, partly because uh, you know we tend to have those in every well. They are less affected by the washouts anyway, so they probably are robust. Um, but if you do need to repair them in any way, edit them, run environmental corrections, do so before bringing them into this module, because they are treated as being good logs unaffected by the washouts. And then what drives the whole uh, process of where to repair are these cross-pot flags. Um, basically, we want you to flag on a cross-plot the data that is good. So create an area, like uh, you know this polygon, use standard cross-plot functionality, create an area. And having created the area, create the curve, call it whatever you want, but I've just called it here you know, cross-plot ND flag, and then bring that into the module. And do the same for neutron density, sonic density, neutron sonic, and for the PEF, it's PEF gamma ray uh, that we use to, to flag the data. Um, it might seem odd that you're flagging the good data rather than the bad data, given that you want to repair the bad data. But the issue is that you know the bad data might be, it might be absence, it might have garbage numbers in there. So it might be you know, neutron values reading over one or uh, so I can't I, I can't flag the bad data because it could be anywhere, but I can flag the good data because I know where that should be. So you flag the good data and bring those flags in. Um, and to repair the density, the, the, the default behavior is um, it's, it's using both the flags, the neutron density flag and the sonic density flag. Similarly for the neutron, the neutron density flag and the neutron sonic flag. Um, then when you run the module uh, on the log plot, you get to see your two known good curves, the gamma ray and the resistivity. These in the next track are the cross-plot flags that I created. So down here you can see, okay, all the data's been flagged as good. And these tracks here are the curves, the individual log curves, with the result of the multilinear regression. So in the good data, this allows me to QC the MLR. Is it a good 
prediction, in which case it's a good fit, it's, it's a robust MLR. It may not be if you have significantly you know, different mythologies. If I have a carbonate sequence and a siliclastic sequence, the MLR might not be good across the both. So you can zone. Uh, the MLR is generated one MLR for each zone. So if you've got major lift boundaries, then just zone the well and, uh, you know, and, and repair accordingly. And then in the intervals where it's not being flagged as good, it's bad. And you can see the impact now, just the shading in the tracks, um, where you've got the colors, it's either more or less. That's the difference between the log and the multilinear regression. And then it's going to splice in the result of the multilinear regression. There's a couple of parameters for you know the overlap window and a bit of smoothing or filtering if, if, if required. These color bars in here are showing you where you've spliced in the result from the MLR. That's the raw logs, and then that's the repaired result. Um, and it doesn't have to be neutron density sonic PEF. You can bring in any curve. So you might want to bring in a compressional sonic, potassium, uranium, thorium from a spectral gamma ray, for example. Um, but if you do bring in other curves, then it doesn't convolve the flags in the same way. Uh, you need to switch off the, the, the convolution and just just a single cross plot flag for a single curve, so curve one, curve one flag. But that way you can you can apply the corrections to any curves. Tilted parameters is a significant upgrade for IP twenty nineteen. Um, this allows you to interactively tilt your parameters. Does what it says on the tin. The reason you might want this, um, you know, for example, at the moment, if you wanted to capture that, you know, if there was a wet clay uh, compaction trend, for example, um, in the density log, and you wanted to capture that, well, you can make yourself a curve that represents the wet clay density as a trend. Whether you interactively use create edit curve to you know, trend curve to do that, or you use a formula or a script. But once you have a curve that represents that parameter, you could just bring it in. Uh, now, IP's had that functionality for many, many years that pretty much any numeric parameter can be a curve. This allows you to do the same sort of thing, but much quicker and easier and, and interactively. Um, and it's activated on the log plots through this new T um, you know, icon that we have here, allow your parameters to be tilted. So once you click on that, you see that's now activated. It's not, it's not gray anymore. And if I go to, say, a, a parameter line, um, if I pick it up and move it conventionally, that's just as normal. That's what you see anywhere you grab it in the main part of the zone. But if you go to the top or the bottom of the zone, the symbol changes. And now you can tilt it. So, for example, in this sand here, in this interval, rather, say zone two, if I happen to know that you know that zone, that sand there was clean, and this sand down at the bottom was just as clean, so I might I might want to make a pick so that that interval there is just as clean to express the fact that this excess gamma ray is not due to clay. Maybe it's due to feldspars, K feldspars, and you know based on core data, that sand is just as clean. So you can just tilt the parameter now. You can just pick it, uh, you know, as you as you want, and you see the you know gamma ray accordingly. So it just does a linear interpolation down through that zone between those values, and in the parameter set, you see that expressed here uh, with two numbers separated by a colon. That's indicating that's a tilted parameter with a value of 40 at the top and 61 at the bottom, and it's a linear interpolation between. Um, now, and you can just type these numbers in if you wanted. So if I wanted to do some further. Uh, you know, tilting, I can put in whatever I want. You just type it in with a colon value, and, and now it's, it's tilting and going back the other way. I could also do this in parameters that are normally expressed on a logarithmic scale. So, for example, a T2 cutoff. Um, if I wanted to, uh, you know, shift that, um, I could just, well, I'm going to leave that there at the top and say at the bottom here if I wanted to drag it like that, if that's what I felt was a valid interpretation. The way in which that's now different is the same thing separated by a colon, but there's a, a log, uh, for LG for logarithm, in front of it. So it's it's a log linear interpolation. It's going to take the logarithm of the numbers, but then do a, a linear interpretation in log space, just like we're showing on the interactive log plot. This basic you know functionality of two numbers separated by a colon that works in all of our normal zonal parameter sets, and it works in things like multiple parameter distribution, batch processing, 
uh, 3D parameters. It's just now common throughout the whole of IP. Okay, thank you, Paul. So also new for 2019 is that we've introduced the concept of global parameter sets. Um, and if you go to uh, the multi-well uh, menu, you'll see these three new modules here, all mentioning global parameters. So what are global parameter sets actually for? Well, you might actually have just run an analysis on one particular well that you're happy with your parameters. Um, and then you want to apply that to tens of wells or hundreds of wells in your database with the same parameters. To do that manually could take a, a very long time. Um, you also might have a, a, a spreadsheet which ha uh, contains all the parameters for all your wells. Uh, again, updating each well manually then running it could take a long time. Uh, by using global parameter sets, we can update the parameters uh, very quickly from from the single uh, uh, spreadsheet. And also that the your individual wells may not have the same strat columns in them. So there, sh there could be some strat columns exist in some wells, um, but not in others. Uh, so the system we've put in place is in intelligent enough that it, it works out which wells require. Uh, the parameters from each each individual zone. So that's what they're for. Where are they stored? Well, you can see that uh, where uh, normal parameter sets are stored at the well level, there's a new global parameters folder above the well level, um, and that's where uh, your global parameter sets are stored. So how do you create these parameter sets? Well, there's two choices. The first option is when you're in any existing uh, module, if you actually go to the parameter grid and you go to the, uh, the button, uh, the load save parameter set button, which has always been there, if you want to make this your global parameter set, Click on here and you'll see a new option here. Uh, so you can give the parameter set a name and save that as a global parameter set and that will be stored in the folder that we just saw. The other option is to actually use the global parameter set editor. So in this case you don't need an existing uh, parameter set. You can come in here and you can uh, select the module that you're going to want to run across the multiple wells, create a new parameter set, and you can also uh, choose a, a pick set. Now that pick set should have all the, uh, represent all the strat columns in all of the wells. Um, so you can see after the setup we can go into the input output curves and we can define the uh, curve names in those and then we can define uh, the zones. As I said the zones uh, must be picks, all the, the actual depths of these zones will be uh, unique to each well so we just put in the, the pick names for the zones in the global parameter set and that they will be uh, populated with the relevant depths for each um, each well. So now you've got a global parameter set, how, how do you easily update the global parameter set? Well you could use that glo uh, uh, the global parameter set editor that we just saw or if you're in any other module in the parameter grid if you click on a zone right click and you can add that zone to your global parameter set just as you can with uh, any parameter. So you might have uh, fine-tuned a parameter in one in an analysis in one well. You want to use that parameter in your global parameter set, so you right-click and then uh, select the change parameter in global parameter set option. 
So how do we use the global parameter set? So we use the global parameter set batch run module. Um, and this is where we can uh, select the module to run the global parameter set uh, name. And we can then run the module. So there are a few various options there for testing the parameter set and the option of whether you want actually an individual parameter set to be created in every well or not. Uh, so once you've set that up, you can uh, run this, and that will run that module with the global parameters uh, in every well you've selected. So another thing we've introduced alongside global parameter sets is the global parameter copy. So this, this module here, uh, so there's actually two ways you can use this uh, module. So the first way is uh, you may have an existing parameter set uh, in each well, um, which and you wish to populate the parameters from that set into other parameter sets that exist in that individual well. So it's like copying parameters from w within the same well. Um, and you can do that for tens or hundreds of wells at once. Uh, this can be particularly useful for anyone that's uh, migrating from Geolog. If you've used the Geolog ASCII importer, uh, you'll be aware that uh, it creates a sort of master parameter set um, from Geolog uh, in each well. And then if you want to actually use those parameters in our modules, you can use this uh, copying function to update the parameters into the various parameter sets from of the modules that you're going to use. The other way of using this is if you have a parameter, uh, sorry, a, beg your pardon, a spreadsheet, um, which contains all the parameters you wish to use in the various wells, you can use this tool to directly populate from the spreadsheet into all the individual parameter sets in every well. So this is how the module looks. Uh, select the wells you want. Uh, decide if you want to use an existing parameter set or a, a spreadsheet as a source of the parameters. And then you can select which zones, the parameters from which zones you want to actually uh, copy. The module will try and match the parameters from the source parameter set to the, uh, the other parameter sets that you're copying to. And you also have full control of uh, selecting which parameters you actually want to copy and which ones you don't. So that's global parameter copy. Okay, another new feature that we've added, which can also save you a lot of time if you're working with uh, large databases. Uh, is our multi-well batch plotting module. I'm just going to open up IP to show you this. So here I've got a database with uh, 12 wells. Uh, in the first well, I've just created a standard triple combo uh, log plot. Now if I wanted to create uh, a, a plot of the same format, uh, for all my wells, that could be uh, very time consuming. Um, so what we can do instead is uh, use our multi-well batch log plotting module. So here we select the wells we want to build the plots in. Okay, so we've selected the 12 wells. We've now got the choice of s sending these straight to the printer or to a graphics file. Now I've selected PDF, but you can choose another uh, format if you wish. Um, now we've also got a choice of uh, where we want these plots to go. So we could create a subfolder in every well folder, um, or by leaving this blank, it will just actually go into the, the root of the well folder for each well. Um, or I might want to put them all into one folder that's uh, what I will do. So if I just go to my, I'm going to go to 
go to a folder called plots uh, within my database. Uh, I can give the log plot a name. You have the option of uh, outputting the actual .plt file uh, as it creates uh, the, the plots, if you wish. Um, plot format, this is where we select your original triple combo plot. There is also the option of rather than selecting a particular plot, you could actually use the default plot uh, that's set up in each of the individual wells, if you wish. But I'm going to use this as a template. Um, and I can just run that. So as you can see, there's a status window here, and that's showing that creating the plots in the various wells. Here we go, that's 12 plots created successfully. Now if I open up that folder, here's my plots folder within the Blue Cat database, and here's all my, my PDFs. I can just click any of these. Okay, so that could save you a lot of time if you need to make a plot of every well in a large database. So another piece of news for you for IP 2019 is that we've actually uh, we came to an agreement with IHS Market to try and bring our IP product and their Kingdom product closer together. So to do that, we've created uh, Kingdom Connectors uh, within IP. So if you go to uh, the Export Data in IP, you'll see a Kingdom option here. Um, it launches this module here where you can select the database you want to copy to in uh, Kingdom, which wells you want to copy, which log data, and also which formation tops. You then get a summary of everything you're about to copy, and then you can go ahead and copy that across to Kingdom. Obviously, you need to have a Kingdom license uh, here as well. Um, so here you can see the the database that's come from IP now is sitting uh, within Kingdom, and it's a two-way process. So you can also just as easily take data from Kingdom into IP. If you go to the import menu, you will also see a Kingdom option there, and it's a very similar UI that allows you to select the data you want from Kingdom to copy uh, into IP. So this should allow users of uh, both products to have the option of using the functionality uh, in the, the other product and easily copy your data between the two while doing so. Okay, so we've seen the new additions to IP 2019, um, but as well as that, we're always continually upgrading our existing modules. Uh, there's around nine modules that have seen significant upgrades in IP 2019, so let's take a look at those. Let's start with well maps. So you'll probably know that uh, if you have your coordinates in the well header, of each of your wells, you're able to launch the well map to see those uh, where those wells are positioned across the field. Now previously all these disks representing the wells were all grey. You can see they're a bit more colourful now. And that's because we've added the ability to colour them by well list. So within well maps we could always <coughs> create well lists by clicking and drawing a box round uh, a specific group of wells and saving to well list but now we can bring those well lists back in using load well list 
um, and you can load multiple well lists. In this case, I have done three, area one, two, and three, and you can see that the wells have been colored according to which well list they belong to. Now, if a well uh, exists in more than one well list, you can see it'll start coloring the disk with multiple colors. Of, of each of the, the well lists it belongs to. So you can see here blue cat 7 actually belongs to three well lists. And there you can see the same discs displayed on the, the loaded well list as well. So that was just an upgrade to well maps. I'm now going to hand over to Paul who's going to give you a demo of the upgrades that have been made to our Proste water saturation module and also our saturation height module. Over to you, Paul. For IP2019, we've made an upgrade to VSW around <coughs> the clay shale ratio parameter. We've basically, we've added interactivity uh, so that you can pick it interactively on, in particular, the neutron density cross plot. Um, now, if you're following a V, clay workflow. Really this parameter is only used to produce the optional output V shale curve because you might just want to plot your final CPI in terms of shale and not clay. And currently you just have to manually enter the CSR parameter. But now we've also included the shale point on the cross plot so that you can actually interactively pick uh, where you believe it for, for that zone to be. Um, and if you pull up the V clay porosity cross plots, there's two of those, there's an effective one and a total one. You will see that we've also uh, we've made two changes on here. Uh, the first is that we have done away with the Thomas Stiber cross plot on these plots. It's still there, of course, if you are following a Thomas Stiber workflow, if you've either switched on the optional clay shell typing for the lock plot, or if you've selected the laminated sands uh, thin bed workflow because the Thomas Stiber cross plot's an integral part of that. But if you're not doing that, um, it's not used for anything, so we've removed it. And what you now have is you still have your uh, fee max parameter, which is on your li limits and bad hole. That's still the maximum clean sand porosity that you would pick. Um, and then this parameter is your CSR, and you'll notice it, it it's it's linked between here and the, the denser neutron cross plot because essentially that is the trend that you're looking at in there. Um, and it's also available in the same way on the on the total porosity plot. The capillary pressure data loader has been upgraded so that you can now copy and paste from multiple spreadsheets simultaneously. Um, so, for example, here I have a spreadsheet where I've got, you know, uh, dozens of plugs on here. They're from different wells and different depths, but the format, the layout is the same for all of them. Um, so, to load that, if we go into the PC data loader, um, first you have to set the grid up for the appropriate curves that you want to load. Uh, and I've already done that and saved the format, so I'm just going to come in here and pick that up. So they're the curves that I've predetermined I want to load. And the new feature is access through this Load From Excel button. Uh, point to the Excel spreadsheet that you want to load, or multiple spreadsheets. Um, it, it handles multiple spreadsheets as well. You can just select uh, files and add more files into it. And then for this spreadsheet, I've got one PC test per sheet. But there might be sheets that are laid out. This is more the way that this data loader did used to work, where all the data is in columns. Um, or if they're in rows, and that's how the sort of the, the standard spreadsheet loader works. But I can use this whether the data is in rows or columns now. So I can just bring it all in one place. It's, it's just easier. The key to it is this mapping the cells, basically. So these are the curves I want to load. And basically, I just go into the grid, into the Excel spreadsheet, and say where the data is that, that maps to those. So the well name is in this cell here. So I define that as being the well name. So that will be picked up in the same cell on every sheet. Um, that's the depth. This is the porosity. This is the permeability. The grain density is in this cell. The PC data uh, in its column, this is the first element of the array, the start cell, and the SW starts here. 
and it'll just load however many values there are in that array it'll, it'll just load them all in that array so having set that up I can then just update that and then say copy to form so it will now read all of that data from the Excel spreadsheet so that's all the tabs loaded they're different wells different depths it's all there um, and I'm loading into a spreadsheet into a curve set MICP so if I then go ahead and load the data uh, you'll then see that the data has now been appropriately loaded um, the closure corrections uh, I've had some work done we've provided some new methods and some little bit of new interactivity on on the plot um, you can auto zoom now rather than having to uh, you know zoom in just by using the uh, the toggling buttons here um, and when you're actually applying the corrections so if I was automatically say picking I wanted to pick a closure correction in here so that it's extrapolating the intersection of this gradient and this gradient that's my closure point uh, now the new methods are how we actually apply that closure correction uh, shift is the default and that's actually the current behavior where this you know, roughly 8% is just um, shifted onto every point so each point is moved this point moves to here this point moves to here and then that point will then close out proportional takes the same saturation closure value um, and divides the SW by that value so that point will go, therefore go to 1 and basically as the SW gets lower the shift becomes less it sort of stretches the curve crop uh, just cuts the plug at that point so these points will have uh, nothing done to them but the closure point will then close out so it's basically just closed straight across there and extrapolate is kind of similar except it now extrapolates the last gradient and takes the closure point straight out to there the other change is that uh, you can now put the axes on logarithmic grids if you want so if you want to put the uh, the capillary pressure for example on a, on a log logarithmic grid um, and, and one of the things that changes then is the the regression lines here they're now log linear because they're a linear fit of the logarithm of the value okay thank you Paul uh, so we've also added some new features to the cement evaluation module I'm just going to open up IP to show you that um, so you, any of you that are familiar with the module you know you add in the completion details on the completions tab um, we've added this uh, option here so that if you've already created a well diagram in the well diagram manager you can import it here to populate this rather than typing it out uh, again. Um, on the isolation summary table, we've added the ability to add formation tops to the table. So if you click on formation tops, select your uh, any tops or picks that you've already got in your well, and then this column appears here so you can see uh, which formation each uh, each line is referring to and that shows up on your report as well as statistics about good cement bonding in each of the formations but we've also uh, added in new tool types uh, particularly I want to talk about the new advanced tools which are the uh, Slumbergy Isolation Scanner and the Baker Hughes uh, Intex tools. These tools give uh, two measurements to, to calculate bond between the casing and the cement. So here we've got uh, impedance and flectural. These have been introduced to uh, try and uh, measure bond in lightweight cements. Uh, the Intex version would be shear and lamb measurements. Uh, so you can interpret those individually then ultimately at the end you get a chance to choose which of these measurements you want to use or you could use either or combined now what combined does here's some isolation scanner data we've got our impedance image which you can see is kind of struggling to see the bond through this section but then we've also got another map for the the flexural and you can see it's showing a stronger bond through this section. 
Then we have a final bond map. So that's almost taking, it's like a best of the two maps. And so this will be our overall result, and that's the one that's used um, in the final analysis and ultimately showing which zones have passed or not. And the workflow for the Baker Intex is uh, very similar to this as well. So that's the cement evaluation module. Now, what's new in our image analysis module? Well, we have uh, image flattening, which is a technique used to remove uh, the effects of borehole inclination and dipping beds from a borehole image. So you can see here there's a raw image, so we take that and the, the dips and create this flattened image here. You can see this with flattened beds. Um, so this is used in the uh, many image analysis workflows, including image calibration and secondary prostate calculations. What else? We have a new uh, type of tadpole, which when you're calculating a breakout, um, you can have the standard uh, tadpole or what we call a propeller tadpole here as an option now. So you can see it presented there. Um, taking in dips, so obviously we've been able to calculate uh, dips within IP, but if you already have a set of dips, we now have this uh, import picks from grid module, so you can take in the picks that already exist and uh, use them in your interpretation in IP. Stereo nets, so you can now uh, edit pick straight on the, the stereo net here. So you can see you can click and highlight data points uh, on the stereo net plot. Uh, so you can interact with it just like you could with the, the log plot itself. Other new features, so we've got uh, support for new tool types, the Halliburton F HFBI, uh, Nabbers uh, Frack View, uh, the Baker Earth tool, that's specifically the, the version that's uh, exported from the uh, tech log. We have the ability to switch truncation direction easily, so when you're on the image plot here, if you do a right click truncation then you can switch whether you're going up hole or down hole. We have the ability to display depth ranges now on the dip polar plots and our stereo nets and also uh, we can add a, a legend so you can see the legends here on the plots. Plotting of picture curves, we've increased the maximum uh, number of picture curves from 10 to 25. And uh, also you can now keep your data type template files uh, within corporate folders and they can be easily uh, accessed from there if you use corporate folders. So here's some enhancements we've made to our acoustic waveform processing module. Uh, a new manual first break tool, um, that's this plot you're seeing here, which allows you to repick the first arrival on your waveforms to improve your delta T calculations. Um, there's also a new log plot editing tool, this little window here that uh, pops up whenever you're doing um, any interactive picking on log plots with an acoustic module. Previously it used to be buttons and drop downs on the, the module itself that you would use, but now you've got this handy little tool that uh, you can just uh, display on top of your plot as you're editing it. Um, we have some new outputs from the semblance calculation to assist with fracture identification. Uh, the ability to input magnetic declination into uh, the module to correct for uh, tool orientation if, it, if that's not already been done in the raw data. Um, some enhancements to the semblance processing itself which should result in smoother images and improved results. 
um, and there's the ability to make uh, custom processing ranges. That's your frequency filter range. So you can have a different frequency filter range on uh, your display from that that you're actually going to process. Okay, for those of you who use the principal component analysis module, uh, you'll notice some changes uh, to that. So on the output tab now within this table, uh, you will see for uh, each principal component we'll have an uh, Egan value and there's also an Egan vector for each of the various inputs uh, for that principal component. So these were previously only displayed on the text report that was output from the module. There's also a new correlation tab and uh, you'll see a couple of visualizations here. Um, one is representing the Egan vectors and the Egan values uh, on this PCA correlation. And then we can see the impact of each input on the uh, each principal component on this uh, PCA quality of representation plot. So you can see obviously the the larger uh, dots here represent a bigger influence of the of this curve on that particular principal component. And by looking at these PCA correlations between various wells, it can uh, give you an indication of the uh, ability to visualise statistical differences between these wells. So the contingency table module, which is the module that's usually used for comparing uh, two sets of fasces with each other, um, one of the limitations of this module has been that uh, you must have the same number of values in each of the fasces curves that you're comparing. Now that's usually not been a problem when you're comparing fasces, but if you want to actually compare, for example, fasces with something different like hydraulic flow units, um, you might not have the same number of values between the fasces and the hydraulic flow units. So we've added this calibrated data option. When that is ticked on, the default uh, or original behaviour uh, will still be the case where you need to have the same amount of values between the two curves. If you switch it off, it will allow you to compare two curves with a different number of, of values within them. And here we can just see an example that we've actually compared hydraulic flow unit data. Uh, there was four of those and we're comparing it with uh, seven different fasces. We can see that the table has done the comparison correctly here. In our mineral solver module, there's a new plotting option here. Um, so rather than a normal plot, you can have a discriminated model plot. So you already know that we can build uh, multiple models in this module and then uh, mix the models based on certain discriminations. So when we're looking at the result of each model, you can now ask to only display the data uh, where this model is being used. So these are the intervals that uh, we're actually using this model in the combined final result. So it just means you can easily see the, the sections that matter when you're QCing the results of this model. Also in Mineral Solver, uh, some new outputs. We're outputting a hydrocarbon corrected density, neutron and sonic. You can see the, the names of those there. And we're actually using the same uh, logic to calculate those as we do when we calculate them in the prostate water saturation module. So that brings us to the end of this section where we've uh, we've seen some of the enhancements that we've made to our existing advanced modules. 
Okay, so that was the main features that uh, are included in the first release of IP 2019. Um, There was a couple of other features I just wanted to mention because they they have been developed, but they didn't quite make it into the the cut-off date for the first release of IP 2019. But they will be following very shortly um, in an update, probably within within the next couple of months. So I thought it was worth mentioning these during this webinar as well. Um, First thing is that there's some new chart types uh, rows, plots, and pie charts. Uh, so there's standalone versions of these um, these plot types. So here we can see on the rows plot we've actually plotted data per zone here, and this pie chart here is uh, displaying a lithology type over a particular interval. And both these types of plot can also be displayed on your log plots as mini plots. See the mini plot rose plot there and the mini plot version of the pie chart there. And in both instances, all the same functionality exists with uh, if you've used mini plots before, which allows you to split display data either from the actual depth of the mini plot or it might be an average over a whole zone or a particular interval, such as 20 feet, display the average of the data. So all those um, features uh, exist for the new rows, plots, and pie charts. Another significant upgrade is to our production logging module. So we've actually introduced uh, the, a workflow for Schlumberger's uh, FSI tool. So that's their... Uh, advanced tool for deviated and horizontal wells. Mm-hmm. Uh, you may remember in IP 2018 we inv- we introduced our first advanced uh, array tool workflow that was actually using the the GE Maps tool, which has the sensors displayed uh, position sorry around the circumference of the bowl. FSI is slightly different and it has the sensors displayed uh, vertically uh, down the the borehole. So we now have a a workflow for that in place. Um, The difference with FSI is we actually uh, use the deft and ghost sensors. That actually allows us to make a three phase, a downhole three phase interpretation. so this is the first time we've been able to do that uh, for deviated and horizontal wells. So that uh, upgrade will be coming very shortly. So that brings us to the end of today's webinar for IP 2019. So just to summarise what we spoke about today, we saw some of the the new additions that we've made, so we saw more automation with the introduction of our auto editing module. Um, we saw new tilted parameters, which we really think is a bit of a, a game changer. We're the first petrophysical package to introduce that. Um, a lot of improvements for those of you working in uh, large multi well databases with the introduction of global parameters and multi well batch plotting. And we've seen improved integration with other products, uh, in particular the the new links to IHS Kingdom. We saw the continuous upgrades of uh, the existing advanced modules, and we spoke a little bit about what's coming soon within the next couple of months. So we hope you've enjoyed the webinar today. Um, There will be a recording uh, made available of this that uh, you will be able to access. We will notify you of that. And if you've sent us any questions uh, during the webinar, either through the GoToWebinar portal or to our digital products email address, we will get back to you directly very shortly. Um, Also, as I say, uh, we should be releasing within the next few days Uh, look out for an announcement for that if you 
don't receive an announcement, it could actually be because you're not on our uh, compliant email uh, distribution list. You'll know due to new GDPR rules, it's uh, increasingly difficult to uh, email out to large groups of people, so it could be that you're not actually on there. If you have any doubts, if you are and you would like to be, contact us on the digital products email address as well and we'll get you signed up there. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, on behalf of myself and by, uh, Paul Spooner, we hope you've enjoyed it and we shall see you the next time. Bye for now.